So hello and, and welcome. Um, my name is Chris Bross. Uh, I may know some of you people out there, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been here at Drive Savers over 16 years in a variety of uh, responsibilities from engineering up to my current responsibilities, uh, managing the research and development team on solid state drive and NAND flash storage technologies. I'm really excited to share some good information on this growing storage market with you, and more importantly, what you need to know about data recovery if and when failure does occur with these emerging storage technologies. If you've already taken the plunge and deployed a solid state drive, uh, I'm sure you've already realized the significant advantages it has over your old hard drive. I sure have, and I know that I appreciate my 12 second boot time and my quick shutdowns and the efficiency of my systems uh, where I have SSD deployed. Uh, if you have any questions uh, throughout the uh, presentation, as I hope you will, please cue them up and you can uh, chat them. Uh, John Christopher will be in the room with me here as uh, the organizer, and we'll take your questions at the end in order, uh, as many as we can, and those we can't will take off of line as well. Uh, you'll get email and a follow-up from us about two hours after the webinar is completed. All of those in attendance will receive a very special Drive Savers Photon flashlight. Uh, if you've ever seen these before, uh, they're very popular with our partners, and we'll be sure to get one out to each one of you have, who has registered and attended today. And at the end of the presentation, we'll also be doing a quick drawing, uh, and we'll be giving away a brand new Lassi Rikiki hard disk uh, to one lucky participant today. And so make sure you stay around for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So with that, let's get started here talking about solid state drives and NAND flash devices, secure, fast, reliable, but recoverable. Whoops, I'm skipping ahead there too quickly. Uh, real quickly, what's new? Uh, well, there's always something new at Drive Savers in our world of storage. And what's relevant to probably most of you listening today in the field you're in, um, a couple of things that have just happened that are really uh, important to recognize. Of course, the floods in Thailand that just occurred uh, three or four weeks ago have inundated the hard drive production industry. And it's uh, creating some serious issues and some big ripple effects out there. Predictions are that supply will be interrupted through Q2 2012, um, possibly 25% reduction in manufacturing this year. I'm sure you've already seen the retail prices have more than doubled on some hard drives out there in the field. Um, our perception is this putting more data at risk with older hardware that's aged out there in the field that's not getting replaced as it should. And some people are talking about this will drive some move to solid state drives um, because they're not having a, pro a production interruption. And this might be an opportunity for people to uh, make that move from HDD to SSD at this point. Um, lots of important stuff happening out there. We hope they get that figured out in the supply chain. And some important news right now from Drive Savers. Some of you may have heard this recently uh, in the press, but uh, Drive Savers is, is very proud to announce that we were just awarded the HIPAA Business Associate status to provide HIPAA compliance uh, for all of our partners out there uh, who are governed by U.S. federal um, uh, policy on this. HIPAA, of course, is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's all about protecting uh, PHI or protected health information any of your clients out there or your organizations that store personal health information from doctor's offices to dentists to hospitals to care providers, all must retain their data for six years as per government policies. Drive Savers is the only data recovery laboratory anywhere with the credential to handle this data uh, without violating federal law. If you have any questions about that, of course, we can follow up later, but please be aware of that new move in the HIPAA compliance space. But let's get on to why you really came today, and let's talk about solid state what? Well, solid state drives, of course. So let's define what an SSD is. Uh, of course, uh, we know that they're fast, reliable, quiet, use low power, secure, have no moving parts. It's the storage of the future and the replacement of the hard drive, right? Well, maybe, but maybe not. So an SSD, by definition, is truly a non-volatile memory-based storage device. What does that mean? Well, an SSD, sometimes called a solid-state disk or drive, is a data storage device 
using solid state memory to store persistent or non-volatile non memory chips, currently using NAND flash as that technology. But we'll talk a little bit about why NAND flash may not be the choice forever. Um, currently, we're looking at a run rate of around 3% of the global storage pool is going SSD, maybe 12, 13 million units produced uh, last year versus 600 plus million hard drives produced last year. The place we're seeing traction and growth with these devices is really in, in consumer devices, um, smart devices, phones, tablets, etc. Ultrabooks, uh, the new category, or pro notebooks, and in the enterprise. So what are we really talking about here? Well, NAND flash memory, as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, is the type of non-volatile storage that's currently used in most solid state drive applications. Uh, it, unlike DRAM or other types of RAM, of course, is persistent. It maintains the data uh, and does not require power to do so. Uh, that, of course, is contrary to how RAM works. The major players in this market, I'm sure you know most of them, SanDisk and Toshiba, Samsung, Intel working with Micron, and Hynix is a huge producer of NAND flash. In fact, uh, recently we learned the iPhone 4S is using Hynix memory, and that's Apple's first time of, of going with that particular vendor. But those companies are producing most of the NAND flash uh, in the world today. So before we dig deep into the NAND flash, I want to do a quick checkpoint here um, and take a, a virtual survey that you don't need to shout out or raise your hand for, but just think it to yourself. Who out there in this audience of 80-some people so far has lost data due to a drive crash? Statistically, probably 75% of you um, would acknowledge that you have. I know I have. I know most of us have out there. You know, the reality is, is that hard disk based storage is what we've been used to for 50 years of technology. And that's what we're used to having in our systems when we've experienced these types of mechanical failures, clickers, problems, etc. That typically look like this. And if you see that image that just popped up on your screen there, that's a, a what's termed a head crash in common terms. In technical terms, that's head to disk interface contact or dynamic head contact where the heads have crashed into the platter, causing a physical media failure. And same challenges of over 50 years of drive technology. Still the primary reason we do data recovery at Drive Savers is electromechanical device failure. And these drives are spinning at up to 15,000 RPMs today for enterprise class drives. The fly height between that head assembly and the platter that you see there where unfortunately a touchdown is down to three nanometers in gap, which is amazing that these drives can operate at that rotational speed and not crash. But it is not a question of if a device is going to fail. It's a question of when that device is going to fail and whether or not you're backed up at the time. So that leads us to what we really want to talk about today. We're smarter now, right? We've experienced these drive crashes. We understand what data loss is. We've all got a perfect backup of our data because we know that all storage is not reliable, right? Or are we just using smarter devices? Or are we just calling these devices smart? And some of these uh, devices, phones, tablets, etc., almost think for themselves. Some of them back up automatically to the cloud. You know, we don't even have to worry about the data stored on these devices anymore. They're so reliable, right? Well, let's dig in here. And let's talk about what devices are out there in the field and what we're doing about data recovery on them. Of course, smartphones are using NAND flash technology. Now, this isn't an SSD like we defined it, but it's using NAND flash on the board to provide the storage. Google's done a great job with the Android operating system. There's over 190 million Android handsets out there uh, and over 3 million tablets running some version of Android right now. Of course, if we look at what Apple has done, uh, to the NAND flash market, it's amazing. They are the largest purchaser and seller of NAND flash in the world right now. Um, there's over 250 million iOS devices in the field, iPods, iPad, and iPhones. And of course, all of those devices are using NAND flash uh, for their storage, as we discussed. Millions of these devices getting into the field very quickly. And of course, the cloud. Uh, the icon here is 
course, iCloud, but it could be any cloud service provider, of which there are many opening each week and some going out of business. Um, you know, I've got to take my one shot at the cloud here as it offers something for some people, but not everything to everyone. Um, it can be an important part of a data protection strategy and a backup plan. It's great as one level of your backup, um, but it is not the only backup that you should be using. And I like to remind everybody out there that the cloud uh, lives on hard drives too, uh, and increasingly on solid state drives today uh, in that enterprise providing storage for some cloud services. So this is a new technology to many people. At least as far as we're concerned, we haven't heard about SSDs too much beyond four years ago. But the reality is, is that NAND flash media um, was invented quite a long time ago um, by uh, one of the doctors at Toshiba. And although NAND flash has been around for a while, we, we don't think of it too often, except in our USB keys, in our SD cards for cameras, in compact flash applications, of course in our phones. But what we really want to talk about is how they work in a solid state drive. So a quick history on NAND flash technology. When it first came out, we were always talking about SLC, or single layer NAND flash. Uh, this was very rigid, uh, that is very reliable, typically military or industrial applications, very expensive to produce. And there's one bit per floating cell. That's the name SLC. It had program erase cycles, which some of you may refer to as write cycles or write limits of 100,000 or more writes per cell before an actual cell would start to wear out. So SLC was the way to go with early implementations of solid state drives, especially in the enterprise. But now we've moved to MLC, or multi-level cell NAND flash, where they're getting two bits or three bits per cell. They're getting greater density, lower cost, and higher capacity. Um, we're now seeing this technology enter the enterprise uh, with the onset of better controllers replacing SLC in the enterprise. But the big potential gotcha here is the understanding of the reliability of MLC flash. Uh, it has program erase cycles as low as 5,000 writes to a particular cell can start to uh, exhibit electron loss. However, you will learn that the use of the controller today mitigates the opportunity for failure using this more dense MLC NAND flash. But MLC NAND flash is the wave of the future, and now we're seeing enterprise level MLC flash as well, and a couple other derivatives that will take us further into higher capacities and lower densities. I don't know if you've ever been able to see um, a layer of NAND flash or a NAND flash chip exposed before. But uh, what you're looking at here is a single layer of 25 nanometer process MLC NAND flash uh, from Intel and Micron. Uh, what you have in a chip typically are multiple layers of this stuff, and I'll show you a slide of it coming up so you can get a more tangible view of that. But the new processes have been announced in the sub-20 nanometer process um, by, I believe, Toshiba and by Intel uh, and possibly by Samsung, where they're, again, increasing density to get higher capacities, uh, more bits per cell, so that we can get more space onto a particular device. Again, the issue is that with this higher density, uh, you have fewer program and erase cycles or, option, or number of times you can write to the device. Um, but again, the controller mitigates any potential for damage there. So let's look at it up close for a second. Uh, this may look like a bad dental x-ray, but it's actually a, a microscopic view of a cross-section of what you just saw on that prior slide. This is actually NAND flash media up close, showing you the individual cells where the data is stored at the top of that image. Uh, and this is that cross-section, giving you kind of a close-up look. And this is a 34 nanometer uh, MLC chip. It's actually measured by the expected half pitch or the distance between identical features of the cells. So if you're looking at those three cells at the top, they're measuring um, from the midpoint from cell to cell. That defines that process size. Um, this is the level at which the data is stored in a cellular fashion, uh, where electrons are pushed across a floating gate with a trickle of electricity that either sets that cell as a bit for positive or negative, that is either used or not used, and it translates up through the pages and the blocks 
to the actual storage level where it turns into the type of data that you're used to seeing. So what about the reality of reliability? I know that's why a lot of you are here and that's what you really want to hear about today. Well, of course, all storage devices fail, you know, including solid state, just not as often as their magnetic counterparts in the HDD world. Manufacturers tell us that the reliability of SSD is much greater than of hard disk, uh, and you can get some good information from the marketing teams at the SSD manufacturers, and there's a fair amount of good data out in the field, um, especially this year, about what we're really seeing for reliability and failure rates. One should think that given the, the technology and the lack of mechanics in these devices that they will be more reliable, but there are other challenges that are presenting themselves. The annualized failure rate, or the AFR, on solid state drives is not actually stated by all the manufacturers. Um, I think they're really trying to kind of figure out some of those metrics, but many of them are talking about MTBF and AFR. Uh, they can be rated as low as 0.25% to 0.75% annualized failure rate, whereas with hard disks, uh, enterprise class drives can be 0.33% failure, can go up to a 1% annualized failure rate for some lower class drives. So statistically, the SSDs uh, should prove to be more reliable, um, but not completely fail-safe. And you know, an SSD does prevent many of the traditional storage failures, but as I said, many new failures are, are yet to be discovered and determined. And failure can pre present itself in many different and unfortunately unexpected ways. Um, in some more traditional failure modes, Flash and SSD is prone to the same problems that hard drives are. Uh, for example, if your spouse finds your phone and doesn't like what's on the phone and decides to throw it down a garbage chute in New York City, physical impact will destroy NAND flash just like it can destroy a hard drive. Or when your dog decides that he'll help you dispose of your pictures on your memory card rather than you consciously doing it, you know, man's best friend is not always your data's best friend. Uh, flash does not hold up extremely well to dog bites. And unfortunately, one of the driving metrics for why we do a lot of smartphone recovery here at Drive Savers, of course, is biohazard, uh, aka toilet phone or phone being dropped anywhere that it's not supposed to be being exposed to environmental contaminants. Um, phones are vulnerable. They're with us all the time, and unfortunately, they get dropped quite a bit. And they don't do so well in certain circumstances of exposure, just like hard drives don't as well. But the reality of what we do here at a professional data recovery laboratory and the challenge that we see in the recovery of these devices is related to component failure. Just like on a hard drive, component failure is typically the genesis of most of the reason uh, drives show up here. Component failure on an SSD is the same. The issue is that there are fewer components and fewer opportunities to resolve. Um, a hard drive is full of replaceable parts, actuators, head assemblies, motors, etc. An SSD basically has two types of memory chips on it. No moving parts to really replace, some circuitry, uh, but fewer opportunities. SSDs do not typically fail gracefully. They are either rocking fast or bricked and non-functional. We call that a very binary failure. They're either good or bad, uh, and power failures and related power incidents uh, are not very nice to solid state drives, at least in the first and second generation. The good news is that current generation SSDs are adding supercapacitors and capacitor technology in order to mitigate power loss and losing any data that may not be written out to the media. But you always need to protect your uh, storage devices with UPSs, of course, regardless of the type of storage you're using, hard drive or solid state. So let's step ahead and look at a solid state drive for a moment. A uh, solid state drive is really just a printed circuit board uh, with the right components on it. It happens to be in a case that looks like a hard drive size simply so they can fit in a hard drive bay. But that's typically just a little metal case with a PCB inside of it. And what we're looking at here is, uh, in this particular case, you can see is an OCZ drive. Uh, and on the board, we're looking at two different components, really. The controller. In this case, if you can see it, there's a Sandforce controller in the middle of the drive, one of the premier companies producing controllers today uh, that Drive Savers is, is working closely with as well. And then you can see the NAND flash. Uh, in this view, you see eight different TSOP chip packages, which happen to be Intel Micron-based. 
and we can see that they're married together on this circuit board without any RAM, uh, there it is, your two components. In some cases, you will see some DRAM on a board, but not in this implementation. So what we're really talking about, though, is the controller as the key. Uh, the controller is the brain of the solid state drive. Just like in a RAID environment, the RAID controller handles how all those disks will operate. But an SSD controller has to be like a RAID controller plus a whole bunch of other IP that it needs to manage internally. Uh, it contains the special sauce, as we say, that differentiates one controller from its competition. Um, right now, the market leaders in this space, and names you're probably familiar with, uh, Sandforce, as 20 some companies building SSDs based on its controller technology. Marvell has always been a big player in this space. Toshiba, J Micron, IndyLynx, uh, of course Intel, Samsung, all of these companies are making the controllers and they're all competing to differentiate whose controller does what and how they can really market the differences in these SSDs. So what about the controller as the culprit? Well, not only is it the most important functioning component of the device, if it has issues, it can be the one throat to choke. That is the pain point in which we need to resolve to get through to the user data. Um, because firmware, just like on hard drives, uh, is contained in the controller here, firmware can have issues. It can become corrupted. It can go into a panic state, or it can need updating and flashing, just like with any other device. Uh, the defect tables, or the flash translation layer is all kept typically in firmware and controller. This is critical to knowing where the data is, where the used blocks are, et cetera, on the device, where the bad blocks are on the device. And the controller also handles encryption key management. Encryption is becoming the default uh, for most SSDs entering the market these days, and in the future will likely be the default on all devices. Uh, these complicated types of intellectual property that they're putting into the controller uh, really dictate that we need to be close to the controller companies on a technological uh, alliance level to make sure that we understand things that can fail and potential resolutions for them. And we're working closely with uh, controller manufacturers today to that end, and that's exactly why we're excelling in this particular field in data recovery. Whoops, excuse me, I hop skipped and jumped the slide there. Here's another image, if you can see this, this is actually a really interesting image. This happens to be an x-ray view of an eight layer NAND flash package that came out of an iPhone. Uh, if you can see what's going on here, this is one of those chips you saw on that SSD, cut in half and a cross section view uh, put into an x-ray machine, looking at the eight layers of NAND flash. Each of those layers of gray that you see there are like that iridescent photo you saw earlier of the Intel NAND flash. All of that stacked into one single chip where their micro leads keep these chips together and they then represent one chip on the board. There might be eight or 16 chips on the board with four to eight layers of NAND flash in each chip. So what are the potential media issues? Well, they're not like platters in a hard drive, uh, but they can, of course, sustain physical damage if an impact occurs or something like that. There can be unreadable media, uh, pages of data uh, rather than blocks that are unreadable uh, and present read errors. These are known as disturb errors or ECC errors. Uh, we can have what's known as cellular bleed where some information or electrons bleed from one cell to another. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, there are data endurance limits, that is, the number of times that NAND flash can be written to before a particular cell starts to wear out. Those particular limits do intimidate a lot of users, but again, the industry has figured out how to spread the data across all of those cells through wear leveling technology so that an MLC-based SSD can exist and last like an enterprise class drive today. Um, one issue that a lot of people aren't aware of is data retention. Uh, data retention is defined as how long the media will hold data over time, and NAND flash media is not intended to be archival. Uh, there are some new archival types coming out, but uh, this is not expected to last forever sitting on a shelf or in a safety deposit box. Uh, Ten years maximum uh, with SLC NAND flash is really the retention lifespan 
uh, and it's even lower for MLC NAND fast depending on the number of times it's been written to. So the quick reminder here is that this is not archival media and should not be treated as such to be put away for the future. There are better technologies for that. So let's step into a process for just a moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do come from engineering, and most of the stuff we do here at Drive Savers is very engineering heavy, um, and we're all about process, as you would imagine. And I'm going to share with you some things that you may not be familiar with, familiar with right now about really how we do data recovery on these devices, uh, and maybe it will dispel a few myths of what is um, possible and what's not possible. But we're really looking at two main engineering methods of recovery from true solid state drives. Uh, one is much more difficult than the other, um, but basically we're talking about having fewer tools in the toolbox for what we can do, but we are always developing new software and logic-based tools to develop I'm sorry, to, to resolve some of the challenges we're seeing as they come forward. Um, lots of reverse engineering and research and development, time and money spent on recovering these devices. Extensive lab time in our clean room facility where we're tearing these apart and doing a lot of individual chip work on them. And so let's talk about those two main approaches. So number one, and the desired method for data recovery from any one of these complex devices is access via the controller and the data interface. Uh, this particular device that you can see there with one of our engineers uh, at work uh, appears to be an Apple iPhone 3GS. Uh, you can see there's a lot of circuitry and components on that board because it's a telephone. So it contains not only a controller and NAND flash, but a lot of other stuff as well. Plus, there's some level of encryption via software in this particular device so that working through the actual data interface, working through the controller, allows us to keep all of that important intellectual property in place so that we can talk to the NAND flash and ideally acquire an image of the device and all of the user data via that controller interface. However, if the controller is seized or failed or inaccessible or the firmware is locked up or the encryption keys are screwed up, we may not be able to get access via the controller. And the other method really of recovery on these devices is going from the bottom up rather than the top down. And what I mean by that is full chip extraction. Um, in this image you can see that a package, um, in this case a TSOP package, has been removed uh, and we're in the process of removing all of them from this particular board. This happens to be Samsung NAND as you can see in that particular case. And ideally here what we're going to do is very carefully um, through some specific tools and, and reflow processes, pull each chip off of that particular board. Each of these chips could have four to eight layers of NAND flash, if you remember, in it. And we have to image every single layer of every single chip first before we even start trying to reverse engineer the algorithms to figure out how the data was written. It's very time consuming. It's very processor specific and dependent and very challenging to get data back in this scenario especially if there is encryption in place. Uh, as you might imagine, encryption, uh, especially if the keys are in the controller, becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to deal with when we're having to pull it off chip by chip. When a package is extracted, um, as I mentioned, we're going into a process of trying to read each of these devices afterwards. We're technically reading each layer of each package um, out and then trying to extrapolate uh, an LBA or a block count uh, from the original device from that. It's very specialized proprietary software that we're developing for each controller to do this. Um, very time consuming in the lab, but critical that we're able to recover the most popular devices on the market and those that are being deployed by all of our significant partners. Um, it will be difficult to be able to do this for every single drive out there. Our hope will be that our alliances with the controller manufacturers will allow us to work through that interface rather than having to reverse engineer absolutely everything that we touch. So what about the challenges in the laboratory? Um, well, as you might have guessed, recovery is not getting any easier. Um, probably never will. That's part of the business world we live in. But with, as with everything at Drive Savers, new technology will always present new challenges which will then drive new solutions. 
So in the world of solid state drives, the things that uh, we talk about uh, most often in our weekly R&D meetings are, of course, self-encrypting drives, full disk encryption. Uh, I'm not sure who out in the field right now is running any full disk encryption, uh, or if you're even aware that you are running full disk encryption in hardware. Uh, most people think of encryption in software uh, via the operating system or file system. But with SSDs, and more encryption is being done in silicon for two reasons. One, security. Of course, at 256-bit AES encryption, that's quite locked down. Um, at Drive Savers, we don't break or hack encryption. We recover broken encrypted devices. So what I mean by that is we need to get access to these devices like everyone else through the encryption keys. However, with a solid state drive, it creates some additional complexities in recovery, especially if we have to tear chips off of the board. Um, some SSDs even have two layers of physical encryption on two different data streams going on in the device. So the question is, if you are deploying a self-encrypting or full disk encrypting SSD, how is your authentication set up for that, and are you aware that you have an encrypting device there? Um, we do believe in encryption, we promote encryption, we suggest you protect your data but treat an encrypted device like any other one, maintain the keys in a very safe and secure location, and back the device up just like anything else. So what about trim? Um, trim as a definition related to solid state drives. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the definition, but um, you should be. Um, we'll talk about it for a moment here. And I'll use a comparison analogy to illustrate the point. Uh, on a hard drive or any type of magnetic-based storage, if you throw a file in the trash or the recycle bin and then empty that bin, that file still exists on that media forever until it is physically overwritten. As many of you know, you can undelete files or recover deleted files from hard disks quite easily with software if there are no extenuating circumstances. However, SSDs work differently. Trim is a command from the operating system that is sent down to the actual storage device and it needs to be a trim aware storage device. Trim is supporting Windows 7, Mac OS Lion and earlier versions with a patch and in the current Linux kernel. Trim is a command that the operating system sends to the storage device that says once you have emptied the recycle or the trash bin I want you to now go out and actually erase that data at a cellular level from the NAND flash. So it is a very uh, intentional erasure by the operating system, not for security reasons, but for performance reasons. Because NAND flash requires that a block be erased before it is written to, the operating system wants to clear that block now so that later when you want to write to it, you have a faster write operation. The potential gotcha, at least in tangible terms here, is that people who think you can undelete files that you have thrown in the trash inadvertently will be sorely disappointed. Um, undeleting files will not be possible when trim is fully enabled and when the trim command has run to remove that data in the background. Um, that's an important thing to understand in the support world for people who think it's easy to get data back from a deletion situation. Uh, in fact, it is not. That's related to this fabulous graphic on garbage collection. I think it at least illustrates the point. Um, but garbage collection uh, on a solid state drive, well, just think of it as trim running in the background as an automatic task of the controller. Um, it is not per se trim. However, it is like trim. The controller will constantly monitor its usage of the NAND flash, and it will go out and clear blocks, pick up partial blocks or pages, and rewrite them to other areas to really optimize the media, balance the bit load across all of the NAND flash, and really make the drive as efficient as it can as an automatic process. This, again, is defined as garbage collection, and it works in other storage worlds as well but that's how it works specific to solid state drives. Um, it does create a whole other discussion about the forensic viability of recovery from these devices. Anybody who's involved in forensics or e-discovery, as we are here at Drive Savers, um, you may know it's one of the services we provide. Uh, there's quite a bit of talk in the industry about uh, what happens with a device that's an SSD that has aged over time 
there won't be as many so-called footprints or tracks left uh, of the data storage history because the drive is constantly cleaning itself. Um, but there are some papers available on that, uh, white papers from the industry. And if you're interested, you can send me an email. I'm happy to send that information to you after the presentation. So looking ahead, what are, what are we going to be seeing next year, later this year, three years from now, in the storage space, uh, specifically related to SSDs? New form factors, hybrid, tiered storage. You know, SSDs don't need to look like hard drives anymore. In fact, we're seeing new notebooks and form factors come out that don't even have space for a hard drive anymore. For example, the new MSATA interface Blade X-Scale SSD from Toshiba, which debuted in the MacBook Air the first time we saw it. As you know, there's no slot for a hard drive in that machine. Samsung now has a solution for this. Uh, OWC, one of our friends out there, also has a solution for this. And basically, this is a, one of the new form factors in the Ultrabook or Pro Notebook category where it doesn't need to look like a hard drive anymore. It looks just like a memory stick. But in fact, those are full SSDs you're looking at right there. This is some neat stuff. I'm sure you've heard about hybrid drives. Well, a hybrid drive a couple years ago was coming out from Seagate, and uh, it was uh, some uh, NAND flash inside of a traditional hard drive. Well, Seagate came uh, with a new version of that design earlier this year with uh, the new version of the Momentus Hybrid, which is using some SLC NAND flash inside of a hard drive to really act as like a super cache to make hard drives faster. Some people think we'll see a lot of that in the future. Or we're going to see things like you see here. This is a particular solution from OCZ where you see a hard drive attached to a PCI card full of very fast flash. This is a hybrid solution right on the motherboard uh, in the very fat PCI bus for really great performance. And they're delivering it at a very attractive price point. This is a new type of hybrid that we're seeing. Uh, tiered storage is entering the market, and, and it has been in the enterprise, but is now making it kind of into the prosumer mid, uh, low enterprise range. Tiered storage basically is defined as SSDs and hard drives coexisting within the same storage ecosystem, being intelligently managed by the controller so that it most efficiently uses the SSD when it needs to or the hard drive when it needs to. This particular solution you see here comes from Drobo, uh, but there's a lot of stuff up in the enterprise class using tiered storage, marrying SSD and HDD together in the same environment. Of course, RAID uh, and storage area network, SSDs for the enterprise, uh, data centers, transactional servers, et cetera. And there's been a couple of reports that came out this year about exactly what people are doing in this space, uh, replacing uh, very fast fiber channel or SAS based disk arrays with solid state drive RAIDs specifically for performance reasons. Um, and we're starting to see that more in the data center and in the enterprise. So with all of that being said, and all the deployment of NAND flash that we talked about from consumer on up through the enterprise right now, the quick and easy summary of course is back it up like any other storage device. I mean, everybody is or will be using some form of solid state storage. I don't know if you've got a camera in your pocket, a smartphone, a USB stick, or a real solid state drive, but chances are you're already using this technology in some way, shape, or form. The benefits are significant. Um, the speed, of course, at least personally for me, is one of the greatest assets. But there are many advantages from reliability to security to low power consumption. Um, but the real equation that you have to look at is the total cost of ownership or the TCO, where prices on SSD right now are 5 to 10x, well, maybe not quite with the drive prices going up, 5x of what hard drives are. Price is always one of the determining metrics in, in deployment. But there's a lot more to consider. Um, remember that all these storage devices will fail at some point. Uh, typically when you least expect it, so make sure they're backed up. And if you do lose uh, data from any SSD or NAND flash device, uh, know that you can call drive savers and we're really best poised to recover that data for you. So with that 
summary, uh, we're going to conclude uh, the main part of the presentation right now and open up to question and answer. And I'm going to see if we've got anything in the queue right now. Um, but please send in your messages if you have any. Okay. It looks like we are receiving some of the questions right now, but due to whatever technological issue, I'm not seeing them, but uh, my counterpart, John Christopher, is. So we'll see if we can uh, answer some questions live right now as we move forward. And remember to hang around for a couple of minutes because uh, we are going to do a drawing for a hard drive as well. John's going to queue up a couple of questions for me here. Hold on just a moment, please. Okay. So our first question comes in about how are we able to recover data uh, from an iPhone's internal man flash if the dock connector is damaged? Uh, that is a great question. So there are, of course, different flavors of iPhone uh, from the original 2.5, the 3, the 3GS, the 4, and the 4S. And hardware-wise, we have different capabilities with each device. In fact, we were meeting just yesterday internally about adding to our capabilities under iOS 5 with the 4S hardware. Um, this is actually a fairly long answer depending on which device you have. So if you have a specific question about recoverability, you can call our hotline at 800 440-1904, and any of our data recovery advisors can tell you about what is and what is not recoverable on a particular iPhone. Uh, I can also take that question offline if you'd like, because it's a little bit of a long answer. Uh, next question is, uh, have, I been in, have we been informed about TLC specs, and how reliable will TLC be uh, related to MLC? I, I assume you're talking about 3-bit per cell. If we're talking about uh, higher bit density per cell, there's a lot of that already deployed out in the field. Um, reliability statistics are still relative based to that particular chip technology inherent to it, but then you have to consider with what controller and in what deployment application is the SSD built. That really will determine more about the reliability of the device. I hope that answers that question for you. The next question, uh, is the biggest downside the ratio of cost to space? Well, uh, maybe it is for some people, but if you're looking at the TCO or the total cost of ownership of a device, there's quite a bit else to consider. Of course, you know, capacities are still relatively low on SSD versus four terabytes on a single hard disk right now. And I don't know that we'll ever see a one-to-one -one convergence of price and capacity on these devices. I think you really need to weigh some of the other variables um, because I don't know that it's really a downside, uh, the ratio of cost to space, but it's definitely one of the biggest considerations in, in purchasing and deployment. Uh, next question, is it true that solid state drives do not stream data as efficiently as an HDD for large loads of data? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that question with the ultimate authority um, to give you what you want to know in that case. Um, I will consider that question offline as well, Kristen, and I have your information. I'll get back to you if I have a better answer on that one. The next question is, uh, I've heard of issues with people using RAID 0 or RAID 1 with an SSD. Is it usually an issue with the controller or is it with uh, the technology that hasn't matured yet? Um, well, it's, it's the former more than the latter. The technology is plenty mature. There's lots of RAID deployment of SSD right now, especially in zeros and ones. Typically, issues related to, um, well, RAID configuration problems or RAID controller failure would be more related to compatibility of those SSDs, typically to the BIOS or to the motherboard to which it's attached. If it's an integrated RAID 0, as some of the vendors are now selling in notebooks, for example, you can in fact get a 4 SSD RAID 0 inside of a notebook today. Um, those are component married and qualified quite well and work extremely well. So there's no inherent known issues with RAID 0 and RAID 1 and uh, SSDs together, but you do want to check with the manufacturer to see if it's been spec and supported for that reason. Um, next question is, what's the difference between trim and garbage collection? That's a great question. Trim is specifically an operating system command 
that is executed when a file is deleted from the trash or the recycle bin, sent from the operating system to the storage media, telling it to go ahead and erase those cells or blocks where the data was stored. Garbage collection is conceptually similar to it, except that it's an automatic process of the controller running to best maintain the SSD rather than a specific command sent from the operating system. Hope that one answers that one uh, um, succinctly for you. Uh, next question is regarding trim. Does that solve the problem of securely wiping data on SSDs? Uh, as I understand, PCI DSS, oh, as according to the spec, one cannot batch process credit card data in clear text with a server that uses SSD because the clear text data cannot be securely wiped at the end of the batch processing. Uh, um, the question is a little longer than that, but I'll, I'll answer this for you. There's quite a bit of discussion out there about uh, how to securely wipe an SSD right now. Built into the controller as a protocol spec is a command called secure erase, and that command can be executed by a software or by the hardware itself. And that does an excellent job of actually removing all the data from the NAND flash media. But there are some elements of the security world um, who don't believe that that is sufficient, at least for the applications needed out there right now. There is a new technology called Enhanced Secure Erase, which is not yet fully deployed uh, in firmware, but that actually allows the erasure of all other areas, defect tables, et cetera, from the NAND flash as well. Um, it's an excellent question and it warrants a larger answer. And uh, Steve, I'll capture that from you and I'll provide you with some docs offline uh, about some of the industry stuff that's going on with that right now. Uh, next question is, how can one verify that an SSD supports or implements trim? A couple of ways. One is from the manufacturer. They will definitely tell you directly of whether or not it's a trim-enabled device. Second consideration is your operating system, of course, whether or not it's supporting trim or if you're using a legacy one, can you patch it to support trim? Um, and other than that, typically trim, I think with some command line feedback in certain OSs, you can see if the drive is trim enabled, but I can't speak specifically to how each uh, OS identifies it. Uh, next question is, uh, what are the price, or are there any price premiums for SSD data recovery? Excellent question. Uh, you heard me mention that it's time, it takes a lot of time and cost to recover these devices, but for our partners and for our customers, we are currently pricing SSD data recovery just like hard drives using the same pricing categories that you're familiar with. So it does not cost any more to, uh, there's no premium to recover an SSD versus a hard drive uh, in today's pricing structure. Another quick question about securely erasing an SSD. Again, there are software applications that will do this, of course, that do multiple overwrites of devices. Um, if you want to look up that spec for secure erase, it is extremely clearly defined uh, exactly how it operates. Um, so again, there is software level stuff, or it can be called by a firmware to go ahead and erase a drive. Here's an interesting question. Um, are the hybrid drives processing data in such a way that deleted uh, data can in fact be recovered? Excellent question. So the hybrid drives really act like a normal hard drive. That is, the rigid media, the platter media, does in fact store all of the user data. Uh, we have done testing with the SSDs in the recoverability lab, and we have found in all of our testing cases that we were unable to produce a failure where data only existed in the uh, NAND flash and not on the platters. So the recovery of data from those hybrid drives currently uh, functions the same with the same ability to recover deleted files from the media itself. Uh, boy, lots of great questions here. Next question, any good tools available to scan an SSD drive for potential failure? Ah, uh, the holy grail question, predictive failure analysis, right? So each manufacturer of SSDs today provides a tool with the SSD, whether it be uh, Intel's toolbox or OCZ's toolbox. Uh, each SSD has a, an app that does some maintenance, does some configuration, some tuning, and some reporting. 
Uh, in fact, I think Kingston is now talking about some of their new SSDs have some advanced reporting stuff in them. So there's no perfect way to know when a device is going to die, but each of these tools from the manufacturers help you look at some of those thresholds to make sure smart status isn't being exceeded or there's excessive failures, and there's some monitoring built into those tools. They're pretty um, manufacturer specific though, and I don't know of anything that's like a third party tool that works with everybody's stuff yet for that purpose. A uh, question on the iPhone, is it possible to recover data from a phone reset to the factory condition by mistake? Uh, the answer is, the short answer is no. The longer answer is there's typically more to know about the process of what happened and how the data was lost to see whether or not maybe we're missing something in the process that gives us a shot to still recover it. But the full factory restore will, in fact, blow up the data. Um, but it is worth a phone call to us because, as I discussed, um, we met just yesterday about what's cap what our capabilities are, and we're capable of some things that people think are impossible currently in the recovery of the iPhones. Uh, next question, are SSDs affected by temperature extremes? Uh, they are. However, those extremes are typically higher thresholds than they are for hard drives. Uh, but silicon will bake or melt uh, like other technologies at a high enough temperature. And how does it affect the recovery chances? Well, if a NAND flash package has been exposed to enough heat that it has actually melted the package, we are not going to be recovering any data from it, just like if a platter was shattered or melted in a fire. Uh, next question, and we, we are, we're going to run out of time in just one or two minutes here. I'm going to take one more question here. Uh, my understanding is that trim is no longer needed or necessary for new SSD drives because of the controller type. Is this true? If so, what is the controller now doing that? Uh, is it speeding up the process to take place of what trim was doing previously? I know trim is, is currently being used and, and well deployed across um, all the devices. That being said, there are new things happening in what are called FTLs, or flash translation layers, that are changing technologically a bit to help deal with this. But no, trim is currently still required. Um, not to say they're going to figure out something better in the future, but, but trim is still a big part of what we do. I'm going to get one more quick question in here right now. Uh, last question. You mentioned earlier about how you remove the individual NAND uh, from SSD when the chip does not work. Why can you not stock the controller chips and replace those out when they're damaged as you do with regular hard drives? Well, that's an excellent question. We do. Uh, on a non-encrypting device, in some cases, a controller can be swapped. However, remember that the controller contains the potential defect tables for that media or the flash translation layer of where the, all, all the LDA blocks are stored. And if we swap that with another controller from another device, those tables are going to be different. Um, in a case where it's the self-encrypting controller, you can't swap it because typically now we're using globally unique encryption keys, and therefore you would lose the key when you bring over another controller. Uh, excellent question, though. 